want to tell you this story about a patient named Sam. Growing up, he was a pretty typical kid. Decent student, good athlete, popular. When he got into high school, he started hanging out with the older kids that were drinking and smoking pot. And one day, one of those kids brought in a bottle of pain pills and offered one to Sam. Nobody ever thinks that they're going to get addicted just by experimenting. But in the United States, more than 150,000 kids under the age of 18 are addicted to opioids. And Sam became one of them. He started using pills every day. Within a year or so, he was injecting heroin. And in the spring of 2017, he overdosed twice. After the second rescue, he was sent to a program where he was treated for his symptoms of withdrawal. And after four days, he was discharged with a prescription for sleeping pills and advice never to do drugs again. Addiction's a treatable condition. There are actually several effective treatments, but sleeping pills aren't one of them. So it was really no surprise that within two days, Sam relapsed and started using heroin again. In the early 1900s, when kids were diagnosed with diabetes, they were admitted to the hospital and treated with a carbohydrate-free diet. When they got better, they were sent back home and told never to eat sugar again. Most of them died within a couple of months. But when we discovered insulin, everything changed. And now kids with diabetes are treated with diet and insulin and grow up to lead a healthy, productive life. But this change hasn't happened with addiction. Since the 1970s, we've known that methadone reduces drug use, overdose, and death. But we restrict it. You can only get it from highly regulated programs that exist outside of mainstream medical facilities. In the 1990s, a newer drug was introduced. It works like methadone, but it's safer. And in 2000, Congress passed the Drug Abuse Treatment Act, which allows any doctor who gets eight hours of training to prescribe this medication from any general medical facility. So in 2017, 17 years later, Sam's story should be outrageous. But actually, it's pretty common. If we think of all of the kids who have opioid addiction as an iceberg, then the biggest part, the part that would be underwater, they never get any treatment at all. And even among the tip of the iceberg that do get treatment, it's only the very tip of the tip that get appropriate treatment, by which I mean one of the three indicated medications for treating addiction combined with professional counseling. There are many reasons for this. For one thing, kids with addiction are often too ashamed or afraid to tell anybody about their problem. One of the first patients I treated, Dave, it was a college freshman who became addicted to prescription pain medications. He came to my program for treatment. We started him on medications, and he was working with a counselor. He was doing really well, but he wanted to keep his treatment a, a, a secret. So he hid his pills, and he lied about his appointments until we finally convinced him that he'd be better off if his parents knew. And so he told them. Actually, he brought them into one of our appointments, and he told them right in front of me. My heart was pounding when his father stood up, and I'm sure Dave's heart was pounding too. And his dad said, son, I'm so proud of you. Your mom and I have known for a while that you were in trouble, but we didn't know exactly what was wrong. Now we see that you figured out your own problem and where to get help. That moment made a really big impression on me as a young pediatrician and addiction medicine specialist. And for the past 15 years, I've been the director of an adolescent substance use disorders program where we treat kids like Dave every day. But we can only get to the kids who can get to us, which is a big problem because too few doctors treat addiction. In the United States, there are more than 750,000 practicing physicians. Every single one of us can prescribe addictive pain medications that really started the opioid crisis in the first place. But only about 37,000 of us 
have taken the training to prescribe medications to treat addiction, only half of us actually prescribe, and only 1% of us are pediatricians. A year or two ago, the directors of a network of primary care pediatrics offices contacted me. They wanted my help improving substance use care for adolescents within the network. With some support from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation, we selected one practice and we designed an experiment that had three parts. First, we put a licensed clinical social worker on staff. Then we trained the pediatricians to prescribe medications for addiction. Finally, as a specialist, I provided consultation and backup medical support. Well, it just so happens that our guinea pigs were Sam's doctors. About two weeks after he relapsed, he ran out of sleeping pills, so he made an appointment to ask for a refill. When he got to the office, he was a little bit unkempt and smelly and he nodded off in the waiting room. When a staff member woke him up to go see the doctor, he was a little bit irritable. So the staff weren't certain that this experiment that was supposed to bring more kids like Sam into the office was such a great idea. But he saw the doctor, he started on medications, started working with the counselor, he stuck with it, and he did really well. In fact, he was really pretty completely transformed and within a couple of weeks, he even became the practice's favorite patient. He asked his doctors if they would help his girlfriend, who also had an addiction, and they immediately said yes, and the staff reached out to enroll her as a new patient, even though the office policy had been not to accept new patients over the age of 15. When that story got back to me, I knew the experiment was a success. I want to share some epilogues with you. So Dave, the kid who brought his parents with him to an appointment, he ultimately graduated college and became a professional. He got a job in a different city and he moved away. The last time I saw him in the clinic, he thanked me. He said he couldn't imagine what would have happened had it not been for treatment. Sam is doing really well. It's, he's been more than six months drug free, he looks great, and he's working full time. We never did catch up with his girlfriend. She was underage and the Department of Child Welfare got involved. She's still on the bottom part of that iceberg underwater. But if she's ever available, we're here waiting for her. The practice is working hard to find kids who need treatment for opioid addiction. They've hung posters in every room. They've sent newsletters home to parents and older patients. They've even gone to the local schools to try and find kids who need help. The social worker is counseling these kids and helping them get their lives back on track. And when she's not working with kids with opioid uh, addiction, she's helping kids who are using alcohol and marijuana, trying to prevent them from going down the path in the first place. My colleagues and I are planning to open a second practice in a couple of months. We have a waiting list of pediatricians that want to work with us. We're working hard to raise resources so we can spread the program as widely as possible. I want to leave you secure in the knowledge that addiction is treatable. If you happen to be a physician, treat addiction. Outcomes from good addiction treatment are similar to or better than other chronic medical conditions. So there's really no reason not to. And if you know somebody who's struggling with opioid addiction, help them find good treatment. You could be saving a life. Thank you.